Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, AmTrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Panath LLP, Aerial Property Advisors, Sterling National Bank, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, B6 Real Estate Advisors, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Properties LLC Handler Real Estate, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marengo Family Foundation, and these friends. Prostate cancer. You hear about it, you hear a different ideas, different approaches, but people realize that one out of six men will have prostate cancer. Not everybody will die from it. And there have been major changes in the treatment of what's happening with prostate cancer. To discuss that topic, I brought the leaders from the NYU Langone Health, my friend Dr. Herbert Lepore, who's the chairman and professor at the NYU Langone running the Department of Urology, and his number one new disciple, okay, James Weissach, uh, MD, who is associate professor, also the head of the Bellevue Services for the MYU Langone. So what has happened in the treatment of prostate cancer over the past 25 years, and how is it being done today? So, Michael, let's go back to 25 years ago when we, when we met. I think you're one of the first uh, people I met here at, at NYU uh, Langone Health. So PSA just came about uh, in the, the 1980s. And, and what we learned was that the higher the PSA, the greater was the risk of prostate cancer. Now we know that PSA has a lot of uh, limitations because it is prostate specific, not prostate cancer specific. So inflammation. So of how did the PSA test come out? The, so it's an enzyme uh, that's in the prostate uh, and it was pretty much discovered to be an enzyme that was only in prostate tissue for the most part. So for men with prostate cancer, they had a tendency to have a greater risk of harboring a, a, a prostate cancer. So it was like in the 1980s, so, so, PSA so, came about. So 25 years ago, you were recommending to people to take a PSA test. That was yeah, the, we were. That was the probably more in the, the, the 1990s right. that, that PSA you know, some of the, 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 the seminal papers uh, in the 1990s showed that with PSA, uh, we can increase the detection of earlier prostate cancer, which was much but, more but amenable to cure. But I think you cure. bring up the interesting earlier prostate cancer. Correct. What happened a couple of years ago by the board saying that PSA testing wasn't that important, right, James? Well, it's an important contrast because you have to go back to the context of what the diagnostic paradigm was before PSA. You'd have to present with some form of symptom, and the only reliable test we had at that point to check the prostate was a digital rectal exam. And you'd have to have developed a clinically uh, recognizable tumor at that point for the doctor to pick up on prostate cancer. So PSA then took us to a level where we could 
take a blood test to assess the for prostate cancer risk and then work up from there. Now, many studies were then performed and there were two primary studies that were really aimed at trying to identify did using that PSA test decrease the mortality from prostate cancer. Those results came out in around 2011. They're highly controversial, but they prompted the United States Health Preventative Service Task Force to give PSA a lower rating, which then prompted people to question whether it should be used at all. So we, we hear about the prostate cancer. We hear the statistics of that one out of six men is going to have prostate cancer. Only 3% are going to die from prostate cancer. What do we recommend for testing for prostate cancer is one. So let's put it in context because, again, if you, there's two sort of competing sound bites, okay? Number one is you don't die from prostate cancer, you die with it because if we did autopsies in men in their 70s, 70% 70 of men will have some prostate cancer in the gland. 3% of men die of prostate cancer. So that's where they say you don't die from it you die with it. However, the other soundbite is this is the second most lethal cancer for men. And if men didn't smoke, it would be the most lethal cancer. So on one hand, you're hearing, ah, you don't die from it, you die with it. On the other hand, you know, we all fear dying of cancer and prostate cancer is a big killer. So, so really what we want to do, and, and, and Jim has been one of the pioneers along with the colleagues at NYU Langone is how do we identify those cancers that are lethal and treat those cancers and actually don't even diagnose right. those cancers right. that are... Right, which people don't that realize that years ago the only thing you did was you did this Gleason study where you did a biopsy, yeah. okay, and as you said to me before in the green room, that wasn't always the key. The key today is with ablation and with other with, So let me do, let, me just, let me just sort of set it in context and I'll try to be brief. So when PSA came about, so we said, okay, your PSA is elevated, you have a higher risk of prostate cancer. We had no imaging tools or biomarkers that really differentiated the 30% of men that would have a cancer and the 70% that wouldn't. So what did we do? We just randomly put needles into the prostate in order to detect that cancer. And sometimes we missed the aggressive cancer, so they were falsely reassured there wasn't a problem. Sometimes we hit those low-risk cancers and they were over-treated and hopefully if there was an aggressive cancer, we diagnosed it, we treated it, and we saved lives. So that paradigm actually decreased mortality from 50 per, by 50%. So Jim said, well, wait a second. You just heard that the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force said, well, we actually are not going to, we're going to advise against PSA screening because there's more harms than there are benefits. Now you say, what are they thinking? We, we showed that we decreased mortality from the second most common killer of men, right, prostate cancer, and yet they're, and that was really driven by PSA. And now they're saying, don't get a PSA. I think the problem was, is in, from their point of view, the morbidity, the risks of those unnecessary biopsies, and then the risks of all of those men uh, who were being treated with cancer that was not destined to be a problem, those harms outweighed the benefits. And, and maybe what Jim can do is go over how we're now taking that patient, because PSA is still the foundation of screening that led to the um, uh, decreasing mortality by 50%. But we've been doing a lot of work at NYU over the last decade to figure out how can we better determine ahead of the biopsy, who is at higher risk, and how then can we more precisely find that lethal cancer? Right, before surgery, in most cases, especially at NYU Langone, there's the MRI being done. Even before, actually, we actually do the MRI before you even get a biopsy. No, I mean, the, the crux of the issue is that our diagnostic paradigm does show improved uh, ability to 
I diagnosed a man with prostate cancer early. But the problem is we couldn't identify exactly where the tumor was in the prostate. That's where multi-parametric MRI really came into play. And what that allowed us to do is see the prostate in a much better uh, way than the ultrasound that was guiding our biopsies were, was able to do in the past. And we were also then able to direct biopsies to an area of suspicion. That has been shown in a number of studies to provide you with an increase in the diagnosis of the type of prostate cancer that needs to be treated because it does pose a risk to the man's health and decrease the detection of those indolent prostate cancers that may not be a uh, risk to the health and therefore probably shouldn't be treated. And we, we have now the ability to really make a better biopsy. And that comes from having an MRI before the biopsy. We call that a targeted biopsy. So what happens if you come to NYU and we're referred probably a, a dozen of these men a week with an elevated PSA. So Jim and I will take a careful history. Has that PSA been slowly going up? That sounds like cancer. If the PSA is up and down and up and down, that's probably more inflammation. We ask about family history and we try to make sort of a, a, a I mean, are we concerned about that PSA? So what we do is we will either do biomarkers such as the 4K test or the Select MDX, and without going into those the, the details of those of those uh, biomarkers, what they do is they tell us what's the likelihood if you did a biopsy that you would find an aggressive cancer. And then we also, in many cases, will do an MRI. Because if the MRI is negative, it has a 90% negative predictive value, which means that you won't find an aggressive cancer if you did a biopsy. So if you come to NYU with an elevated PSA, Jim, I'd bet 20, maybe 30% of men are not going to get a biopsy because based on their biomarkers and based on their MRI, they are at very, very low risk of having a prostate cancer that's aggressive, so we're not going to biopsy that. So yet. now let's say after all these testings, you find out that the person has prostate cancer. Could be a small type of prostate cancer or could be a, a lethal type of prostate cancer. What, do you, what are the different treatments today and what are the recommendations for people based on age, based on you know, the, the, the Gleason testing and so on? What, what, are you, what are the different approaches and alternatives to people? You know, I consider prostate cancer has a tremendous spectrum, okay? So let's look over 33 years that I have of treating prostate cancer. The youngest patient I treated was 37. The oldest was 83. Some men, when we do the biopsy, they have such low-risk cancer, we wonder, is this a threat? And there's others that come to us that's so aggressive, we wonder, can we cure them? Some will come in and say, Doc, just cure my cancer. I know some of the treatments will have issues with continence and erections or rectal problems, but just cure me and I'll deal with that. And others will say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Quality of life is really important to me. And so, you know, I know that many men with prostate cancer don't die of it or they're not harmed by the cancer. So I might be more inclined to, to take a, a, a less aggressive approach. So historically, uh, we basically had surgery and radiation. This goes back again to the 1980s when I started to practice. Uh, we realized that there were a lot of these low-risk cancers that didn't need treatment. That's called active surveillance. And what we do is we say, you know, right now we, we just have follow up. Right. We'll Correct. do we'll do biopsies. But then what uh, I think Jim and I and others at NYU have really pioneered is so what Jim was saying is that the MRI is going to be able to help us identify where that cancer is in the prostate. The random biopsies did it. So now, if we see a cancer that's localized to one area of the prostate, well, what did you do in breast cancer? You took the whole breast out. Now what do we do? We you do, do the, lumpectomy. Uh, the lumpectomy. Kidney cancer. We took out the whole kidney. Now we do what we call a partial uh, nephrectomy. When we didn't know where the cancer was, we had to take out the whole prostate. But now that we can begin to identify the, the area so, that so has am I hearing that there are less therapy. chances of taking out the entire prostate, but more on treatment, or more of freezing it, or radiation, or other seeds, or other approaches? I think that the key point here is being able to localize the tumor within the prostate itself opens the door to exploring and treating in different ways that we didn't have available when we didn't know where the tumor was. And so this does 
really open avenues for different types of strategies. But those, as Dr. Lepore mentioned, those strategies are already actively employed in many other cancer processes, breast, kidney, et cetera, there are many. Uh, we're just starting to adapt those to prostate because we can tell where the tumor is. Now, it's very early in our, on in our experience with this, but the idea is to do a partial gland ablation. What that means is to identify where the tumor is and treat just that area. By doing that, if you capture all of the cancer cells in the treatment, you decrease the morbidity and the side effects associated with the treatment. This is very different than the whole gland treatment options, which are our paradigms that we had when we didn't know exactly And the where whole gland was, was taking at the entire gland. Or, or radiating radiation. the entire gland. And so the, the balance here is you can have fewer side effects by doing a partial gland ablation, but you may risk having a tumor develop in a different portion of the prostate gland later on or not ablating all of the tumor. So there you, you trade off some side effects with maybe some oncologic risk that we need to explore and understand over time. But that's really what the MRI has empowered us to do is to say, here's where the tumor is, let's treat just that spot. So let's take the patient that comes in. In fact, I think this week between the, the two of us, we took out three prostates. We're probably doing five of these focal therapies. So we've now, with a reasonable confidence, we've identified where the aggressive disease is. Just this week, we elected to do the cryo using freezing, but we have high intensity focus ultrasound, we've got radio frequency. If there is a technology that is even in development, uh, it's passed through uh, NYU. So the patient comes in, uh, we do under a general anesthesia, we ablate the lesion, it takes about an hour and a half. Uh, about uh, an hour or two later, they're on their way home. They have a catheter, it comes out in a day or two or three, they're back to work within three or four days. We have never had a patient who had any element of incontinence. And in some men, there's a transient decrease uh, in erections, but as Jim indicated, there's no free lunch. If you could be treated uh, for your prostate cancer uh, with focal therapy, we have the radical prostatectomy, right? Um, and so who's uh, being recommended for the radical today? Well, it's a complex decision. So first of all, higher risk disease, what we call multifocal disease, younger men who are more uh, better surgical candidates, I think are still very good candidates for a radical prostatectomy. And I think that they should be offered that. Uh, it does offer very good, if not the best, cancer control. It does come with a higher side effect burden than say doing a partial gland ablation. This discussion is very complex and it really does rely a very good understanding of what the outcomes would they, the patient would expect, what the side effect profile they're willing to tolerate, and also the cancer risk level they're willing to tolerate. The MRI helps us as a tool on all of those fronts. Having a better biopsy helps us on, as a tool on all of those fronts. It makes the discussion much more uh, thorough and understanding. So but today when, when you're doing the, you know, the, the biopsy, are you doing specifically the different locations based on the MRI that you're looking at, or are you still doing, let's say, a six test, six or It's 12? complicated because what we do at NYU, the, 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 the money is in the target, right? Uh, and so we have, uh, we've done co-registration. We take the MRI, we co-register to the ultrasound. Let's just assume my ring is the area of concern. So we have an MRI, we make a 3D model, the ultrasound, we put them together. The computer takes the target, transfers it to the ultrasound, and the navigation arm will actually uh, specifically target that region. We end up still doing the random biopsies today. Uh, it's a bit complex, one, because our co-registration may not be perfect on the side of the lesion, and we want to have even greater confidence that that is a good candidate for focal therapy by having a negative MRI and a negative random biopsy uh, on, the, uh, on the opposite side that will be the untreated side if they elect to undergo focal therapy. So, so here's a big question. The good and the bad of the internet are the good and the bad. Because people, when they, when they have a condition, they Google it and then they read the 5,000 different opinions of different approaches <laughs> and you know, they hear PSA, Gleason test, biopsy, ablation, cyber knife, and this and that. How does somebody make a conscious decision of what they really should do? Okay, 
that they should take the prostate out, that they t should have radiation, they should I have I got seeds. a simple answer. You come to Jim and I. I agree, right? but... Uh, and then no, we'll, no, give no, it, no. we'll give no, we'll, no, no, we'll but, serve but, it up straight, but, but right? But now I'm really, I'm really asking for the situation. It's very difficult, okay, it's, you know, it's. It, I, I think that uh, Stacy Loeb in our department uh, published an article that was actually, I think, on the front page of the New York Times, and it was basically taking the Internet uh, and looking to see which were the highest searchable... Um, uh, information and there was almost an inverse relationship between the least reliable information as judged by a group of experts and and the number of hits that it was uh, that, 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 that it was getting so I guess that the answer is to to make sure that when you go to a provider that they're trying to figure out what's best for your cancer rather than trying to figure out how their treatment is best, so, so is best so for you. So here's a question. A person who has enlarged prostate, what is the chance of that person having prostate cancer? Or what, what do you recommend for them? It's the same screening approach as a man who doesn't have benign prostate hyperplasia. We would still apply the PSA as a screening test. If that's enlarged we could, or if that's elevated, you can use biomarkers and MRI. That in and of itself doesn't change my paradigm. In fact, most men are going to have some component of benign prostatic hyperplasia as they age. And that, that just clouds the diagnostic capability of the, of the PSA test. You have to take that into consideration. Many people who call me are, because they know I've been involved with health care screening, you know, when, when they hear that their PSA is three or six, you know, they, 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 they get out of shape and they, they, their mind is, is, is saying that I have prostate cancer. And I say, you, you really need to go to see somebody who understands the different approaches over there. I think every man, whether you come in with BPH symptoms or not, is going to get a PSA, right? I mean, they're not totally independent, because if you have a very, very large prostate, and that very large prostate, we'd expect to make more PSA than a small prostate, we sort of can make some adjustments. So if you come in and you are a 75-year-old man, you have a 100-gram gland, which is like three times the size, and your PSA is 4.5, you know, we're not going to be that concerned. Maybe we get a biomarker just to give us one more level of reassurance we don't have. You're a 50-year-old man. You're, 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 you have symptoms, but your PSA is, uh, is 4 at age 50, and you have a family history. We're going to be much more concerned about uh, prostate cancer. So we're going to pretty much assess their symptoms independent of their, of their, of their PSA. And what do you recommend today for screening? So let's say somebody's 40 years of age, no family history of prostate cancer. Do you recommend that they get a PSA test, do a digital rectal test? When, when, when should somebody be tested today for potential prostate cancer? So I'll tell you the guidelines. So let's talk about the guidelines. The guidelines say between men between the ages of 50 to 69, you should consider the risks and benefits of screening and have a discussion with your doctor. Less than 50, at least our AUA guidelines, they say, well, they're not going to recommend screening because we don't have enough data because those men weren't included uh, in the screening studies. And so what I would say if you're between 40 and 50, I think that's a, a good time, not necessary to get an annual screening test, but at least to get a couple of tests along the, uh, along the, the way. Family history, African American, uh, I recommend starting screening early. The other challenge is at what age do you stop getting a, 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 a PSA? And as a general, general rule, if you have a 10-year life expectancy or greater, I believe that's the sweet spot where finding an early cancer can make a difference in, uh, in preventing metastases or, or mortality. You've done over 2,500 operations. 5,000. 5,000 operations. What are the statistics that we were talking about, people's survival rate? Well, listen, it's very reassuring. So in fact, we're just getting ready to publish our data. Um, and what we did, just to make sure, you know, Michael, it's very hard to find, to follow patients for 15 years. So we actually went to the National Death Index 
So by taking our patients' uh, social security numbers, we actually could tell who is alive uh, and, and who is uh, deceased. And at 15 years, uh, over 90% of our patients uh, at 15 years uh, are, 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 are alive. Now, some of them may still have their disease. We weren't able to be uh, there, and differentiated. These, and these are of the 5,000? Of the 5,000. Patients that you did the radical surgery on. Correct. Now, I, I realize in that group, there are some men I did surgery who, if I didn't do surgery, they would still be alive, right? So it's not as though I, I, I seem to have prevented 90%. I've allowed 90% of people to live up to 15 years. Now, many of those probably would have uh, lived had I not taken out the prostate. And so what we're now, because remember, this was the era from the 1990s to right. 2000s when we'd operated on, on low risk. See, if I operate on a men who didn't need it, I'll have a, a no one will die of it. And if I operate on only those men uh, with very advanced disease, then few will, mm -hmm. uh, will, will, will be alive in 15 years. And I think what we're now trying to do is identify up front who's that person who has disease that uh, I can cure, but if I didn't offer them a curative treatment, they would either develop metastases or succumb to the, and that's our challenge today. So, uh, I think in summation, there are many alternative treatments and people should evaluate. And if they need surgery, let it, let, let it be done appropriately for surgery or ablation or radiation or different approaches. And I'm happy that the city has two of the top notch and the entire NYU urology group, which are how many doctors? Oh, uh, we're probably up to 25 doctors Up to today. 25. You knew it when it was four. Right. I'd like to thank Dr. Herb Lepore, Dr. James Weissach, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.